Good morning, everybody, and welcome once again to our Sunday morning time together here at the Digital Cathedral. I trust that you had a great week and that you're looking forward to even a stronger week as we get this brand new year underway in January 2022. Wow, hard to believe that. I want to continue this morning with our study of John. We, we read last week and we, got, we kicked this study off and I want to go through some things this year from the book of John that I think are extremely enlightening and maybe bring a little bit of different perspective than what you've traditionally heard as you've maybe heard teachings on the book of John. So last week we looked at the first five verses of chapter one and what we pulled out of those first five verses <clears throat> is that everything that was created was created by the word. Everything that you see, that you don't see, principalities, powers, dominions, everything that was created was created by the Word. And so I want to pick it up this morning. I want to, I want to go from uh, verses 9 through 14. We did the first five verses, and there's some real truth in, in verses 9 to 14 that I think is absolutely, absolutely essential to us at this point in our development in our development as we walk as manifested sons. I'm gonna say some things this morning. I'm just gonna put the caveat out there. I'm gonna say some things this morning that are probably gonna put your mind on tilt, maybe blow some of your old theology or traditional thinking. And what I wanna challenge you to do is to come back and to listen to this a couple of times until it actually sinks in. You know, I've learned a long time ago that as a teacher, there's two or three different messages that you that actually come out anytime you teach. First of all, there's the teaching that the teacher desires to teach. Second of all, there's the teaching that those that are listening actually hear. And then third of all, there's actually the teaching that was taught. So all, the, all those are on different levels. And sometimes you just don't pick up on everything till you go back and listen to it a, a couple of different times. So let me read, let me read for you real quick from the New King James Version, John chapter one, verses nine through 14. And then we're gonna come back and kind of dissect this and expand on it a little bit and just be, be, be prepared that maybe I'm gonna hit some things that might make you a little bit uncomfortable. But again, I just challenge you, crock pot it, think about it, roll it over. If it doesn't make sense to you, then just dismiss it or think about it a little longer. But I think for some of you, you're at the point that what I'm gonna say this morning is going to open up your consciousness and enlightenment a little bit more. And that's what I try to do every week at the Digital Cathedral is just take another little step forward and sometimes come back and repeat and reiterate what we've, what we've been doing. I call those Stop the Bus Sundays. And I'm probably due for a Stop the Bus Sunday here pretty quick. I just got so much I wanna get out that it's hard for me to stop and just go back and, and um, repeat but I know it's necessary. All right, let me go John chapter one, verses nine to 14 out of the New King James. If you want to follow along, chapter one, verse nine says this, this was the true light, which gives light to every man that comes into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the, and the world did not know him. He came into his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the children of God to those that believe on his name. Who were born not of flesh, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of blood, but of the will of man, but of God. Now let me read that 13th verse again, because this is a real important verse. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but were born of God. Verse 14. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Man, there is so much in those verses, so much in those verses. <clears throat> the, first, the first thing I want to point out is something in verse, verse 14 that is going to bring an entirely different perspective uh, to your life than maybe you've ever heard before. So let me, let me just read that 14th verse again because it might be one of the most misunderstood and yet explosive verses in the entire book of John. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Let me just, first part of the verse. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, I'm gonna make a shift for you spiritually and mentally on this verse. I'm just gonna take you, I'm gonna move you over in your understanding just a little bit because I need to clarify what that verse is saying. Translators did a terrible job with that verse, a terrible job. And I think there, there might've been a reason for it. 
I don't think the translators wanted you to get full impact of that verse because it blows the cover of religion and, and the ability of religion to lord it over you as having uh, something that they need to lead you to in the way of truth. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to clarify this verse for you and it's going to change the way that you think. And I think the translators looked at this verse and said, man, we can't, we can't translate this correctly because it's going to stop people from coming to us as the religious leaders and asking us what the Bible actually means. Now, I want to look, I want to look at one word in verse 14, and it's the word among. It says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word, that word among is at best weak. And at worst, it's very deceptive. It's full of deception at its worst. The Greek word for among is a very simple, two letters, E-N, E-N. It's, it's in, in, E-N. And it means simply this. The word that is among right there means, means in or within. In or within. It's the same word that is used in verse, uh, for example, in verse 5, verse 5 says, and the light shines in, E-N, the darkness. It doesn't say, why didn't they translate, why weren't they consistent and said the light shines among the darkness? Because it doesn't make any sense. It's not accurate. And in verse 10, the same word is used, he was in the world. Why doesn't it say he was among the world? because he was in the world, he wasn't among it. So when we get down to verse 14, in order to remain consistent with the translation of that word E-N, we have to look at it as meaning in or within. So let me read that verse for you correctly. And this, this throws everything into an entirely different dimension. Let me read the verse as it should be read. And I hope this helps you. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among, not among, but the word became flesh and dwelt in us. The word became flesh and dwelt in us. And the word us is plural. It is not singular. It's not speaking just about Jesus. It's speaking about all of us. When Jesus became flesh, and I want to get ahead of myself this morning, when he became flesh, when the word became flesh, there was a shift that took place in humanity and we all became word that became flesh. Now let's, let's just look at it and you can get your Bible. I don't care what interpretation you want to look at, what version. And the word became flesh and dwelt in us. And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the son of God. All right. So that's a, that's a, that's a powerful re revelation. Here's why it's so powerful is because it eliminates duality. I told you last week when we started to study the book of John, that John eliminates the eye of duality of two of Christ in you, of Jesus in you, of the Father in you. It eliminates that. The Word became flesh. The Word became one. The Word became totally enmeshed in flesh. It's no more Christ in flesh. It's Jesus, the Word made flesh, and it dwelt in us, in us. The two have now merged and meshed into one. And, and again, notice it says us. That's plural. That's all of us. I will guarantee you, you've never heard that taught in church. You don't, you've never had a pastor that taught that to you before. That's why you're at the digital cathedral. I got nothing to lose. I'm just going to tell it to you the way that it is. I'm going to tell you the way that it translates. I'm going to break truth down for you. And, and if it steps on your toes a little bit, if it, if, it, if it makes you uneasy, that's good because that means you're going to be doing some changing. So here's the bottom line on that 14th verse. You are the word that has become flesh. You are human and you are divine the same way that Jesus is human and divine. Now, there is a couple of distinctives that Jesus has that's a little bit of an advantage over us, and I'll point that out in just a minute. But he divines it down in that verse by saying this word dwells as one in us as us. Are you, are you with me? The word became flesh and it dwelt in us in you. It dwells in me. I didn't know that before. Nobody ever taught me. Nobody ever told me that before. So man and word are one as Jesus and word are one. And when Jesus came, the word became flesh. 
And at that point, as I said a minute ago, all of humanity made a shift. Last Adam brought something to the table that the world had never seen before. Man had never experienced before. The Christ, the eternal word, is now joined to flesh forever. The eternal word is now joined to flesh forever. Jesus is the representative of mankind. What happened to Jesus happened to all of us. When Jesus became the word made flesh, then you and I became the word made flesh. Jesus is the representative. Let me say it again. I can't, I can't emphasize this too much. There's only been two men that ever lived. First Adam, last Adam. When Jesus came, shift. We all became, as Jesus became, 100% divine and 100% human. That's called the great exchange. He became us so that we might become who he is. What is it? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 says this. Now listen closely. He made him to become sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He made him to become sin who knew no sin, that we who knew no righteousness might become the righteousness of God in Christ. There's an exchange there. He took what I am so that I could become what he is. And that 14th verse lays it out so well. And the word became flesh and dwelt in us, and dwelt in us meaning that we became as he was. So let me read verse 9 and read verse 15 out of that first chapter again that, that we just read. Verse 9 says this, This was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. That just confirms what we said in verse 14. Jesus is the true light that lights every man that comes into the world. And verse 15 says, John bore witness of him and cried, saying, This, this is he who am I have said, he that comes after me is preferred before me because he was before me. All right. Now, verse, verse 9 and verse 5 say, say the same thing. Look at verse 5. There was a man, um, verse 5, and, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So what, what happens is it says that the light shined in darkness, light shined in mankind, but mankind didn't realize it. Man, man didn't comprehend it. What was that light? Verse 9. It was the true light, was the Christ that shines into every man. I'm not sure I'm communicating that. So let me come back and just read verse 5 and 9. Verse 5. Verse 5. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Verse 9. That was the true light, which gives light to every man that comes into the world. So what's he saying here? He's, he's saying, verse 9, all men are enlightened. All men have the Jesus light in them. But verse 5, not everyone has comprehended that truth or has seen it. Now, why you are on the cutting edge of this, why you are on the front edge of this wave, that you are now enlightened, you see that there is a Jesus light that shined in you well before you ever knew it. That's what, was, what Paul said. He said, when it pleased the Father who separated me from my mother's womb to reveal the Christ, to reveal the light that was in me, not to me, but in me. Thanks, Galatians 1, 15, 16, right in there. And that's what happened to you. You've lived maybe 30, 40, 50, 60 years, and you never saw that there was a Jesus light that could not be extinguished, that was within you, but you just weren't aware of it. Now, this last Adam did have, does have an advantage. There's a distinction there that I think that we need to draw. The last Adam, there's an advantage he has over you and me. And the, and the advantage is this. He was never aware of the law. He never had to contend with sin consciousness that entered into the human race because of Adam. Now, those of you that have followed me know that I, I, I am not about the, the Adamic nature. I don't think there is such an am, animal's ad, Adamic nature. I don't think you were born in sin. I don't think you were born totally jacked up, messed up, totally depraved. I don't believe the scripture teaches that at all. I don't think the scripture teaches it. What does the scripture teach? I'm glad you asked me that. Let me show you what the scripture teaches. And again, this is going to adjust your thinking because a lot of you that are here at the Digital Cathedral, you're under the misconception that you were born in sin, separated from God, messed up, uh, 
totally uh, apart from him. And that's not what scripture teaches. How can you be ever be apart from omnipresence? How can you ever be separated from something that is that has presence everywhere? There's nowhere you can go that he's not. Wherever you're going, he's already there. So here's what's happened. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. I've already told you enough this morning. That's probably got you on tilt. And you need to come back and, and digest some of it. But here's there's no endemic nature. You were not born in sin. You were born as a child of God. He chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1.4. He chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world. That's an objective fact. That's an objective fact. Now, subjectively, you, haven't, you didn't experience it. John's telling us that you weren't aware of the Jesus light. Now, here's Jesus had an advantage. He was not born in sin. He had, he had no consciousness of sin. He had no remembrance of sin. There was no, there was no uh, laying into him from generations. The things that have made us think we're separated from God. But here's actually what took place. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men. Why? because all sinned. Now, what is that verse saying? It's saying that there's one man, Adam, that opened the door to sin, opened the door to missing the mark, opened the door through eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And here's what happened. All of us walked through that entrance. We were groomed. Our culture taught us. There's no way that we could avoid it. We all walked through. Adam opened the door. Adam opened the possibility, and we all walked through it, and it says it spread to all men. Why? Because all sinned. That's what it says in the 12th verse at the end of it. Why did it spread to all men? Was it because Adam took his nature and God put that sin nature in everybody? Absolutely not. It spread to all men because all men sinned. The fact of the matter is we were all born with a Jesus light. We were all born with the potential to be enlightened. The fact is nobody ever flipped a switch for us. I'm flipping the switch for a lot of people around the world and are seeing their authentic identity, which is divinity. They're seeing that the word became flesh and dwelled in us and we beheld his glory. We saw the prototype and we understand fully that we sinned voluntarily. We all sinned. We all made the mistake. Last Adam did not enter into that mess. He is the one man that came with no remembrance of sin consciousness, was not groomed by culture to enter into sin. Now that fact, that fact that you and I have sinned does not change the truth that all have the Jesus light and all have the eternal word, the Christ, which is the eternal word. Everything that was created was created by the word, the Christ. He's the, he is the, 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 the empowerment of creation that we all have that within us. It doesn't change the truth. Just because we all voluntarily sin, walk through the door, doesn't change the truth, doesn't change the fact. Paul nailed it down. Colossians chapter 1, verse 25. I'm going to have to hurry because I'm, I got a lot to get out this morning. Colossians chapter 1, verse 25. Paul says, I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me, to you, to fulfill the word of God. Now, here's the fulfillment of the word of God. Verse 26, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and generations. We didn't know it. It's hidden. It's, be, it's bro being brought to light today. Some saw it before this, but not many. It's being brought to light. This mystery is being revealed. And it's, the mystery is this. Christ in you Gentiles. Christ in you Gentiles, the hope of glory. So he's tying this very thing back up to what John said in the first chapter that when the word became flesh, it dwelled in us and we beheld its glory. The Christ is in us. The Christ is within us. The Christ is one with us. There's no duality. There's no you and there's no Christ and there's no bridge that we have to try to jump by a magic prayer or some religious hoop to jump through to make the two one. It is You are already one with him. It's a matter now of being able to see it and be awakened to it. You say, well, I, I don't know about that. Well, it's too late. <laughs> it's too late. Already through the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Christ, that has already been direct deposited within you. Now it's just a matter of fact of all men awakening to that truth that has already been deposited within them subjectively. And that's what Paul was, was getting at in Philippians chapter 2. 
Paul says, here's, here's how it's subjectively going to look out. Here's how it's going to work out. Objectively, it's a done deal. The Word became flesh, dwells in you. The Christ is within you. Paul said, the, the mystery is revealed. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And then Paul says, here's how it's going to look subjectively. Here's how it's going to work out. Philippians chapter uh, 9, 10, and 11 says there has been given to a name above every name to Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Here's, here's the subjective working out of the awakening. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Now, back in religious days, we looked at that and said, well, you know what? He's gonna, he gonna, he, you and he going to bow, and I'm going to tell you what. It's gonna, he, if he, you don't want to bow, he's going to force you to bow. No, God doesn't get glory out of forcing you to do anything. Truth of the matter is, subjectively, this is going to be worked out in all men. And we see in, in John chapter 1, verses 9 through 14, it, it's what the new creation is all about. It's, what, it's, it's the culmination of what Jesus came and died and resurrected in order to impart to us and enlighten us too. The Christ now dwells in all. The new creation, the new creation comes through the last Adam to make us as he is in this present world. So again, what, what last Adam didn't have to contend with it, you and I contend with, that is, that is, that is stopped our awakening is, is what Paul called in Colossians 1, he called it being separated and alienated in our mind because of sin, because of wickedness, because we walk through that door that Adam opened. I can't blame Adam for walking through the door. I walked through the door voluntarily. I ate from the tree of the knowledge of good voluntarily because that's, that's what I was groomed to do. That's what I was taught by my culture, by my family, by my church, by religion. That's what I was taught to do. So I, I did it voluntarily. Might have done it in ignorance, but that's what caused the problem. So I, I want you to understand in a new way, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, that, that verse that evangelicals use to bring you to the altar. It says, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. Now, religion is hung up on that in Christ. And because of duality, they have said, you're here and Christ is here. So we got to get you to where he is or to get him to come from where he is to where you're at. And the way you do that is you accept him as your personal savior. You confess all of your sins. You pray this prayer and you open your life to him. Religion is hung up on the in Christ part because of duality. Can you see that? And I've just walked you through scripture that shows you there is no duality. There is no duality. If any man is in Christ, you are in Christ. Your neighbor is in Christ. Your friends are in Christ. Your family is in Christ. Some know it, some don't know it. That does not negate the fact. That does not negate the truth that they are in Christ. So if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away, all things have become new. Now it's a matter of waking up to it. Now it's a matter of seeing it in its fullest. And that's the process we're in. That's the journey we're in. That's what's gonna take the ages to come to see the depths of the grace and the goodness that God has given to us in Christ Jesus. Everything that is within us. I can't prove it scripturally, but I have a hunch that however far you develop in your in Christedness on this side of the grave is where you're going to pick up on the other side of the grave. Some are going to be totally unenlightened and they're going to come through a process then that they didn't get now. But at some point, all of us are going to be brought up to speed. Can you understand that? Old things have passed away. All things have become new. There's, there, there, there's something that we were always trying to reach for, but we were never sure we could ever get it. And that was the frustration of religion because nobody ever taught us. That's why nobody, that's why we could not come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ because the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher cannot teach something they're not demonstrating or have not seen for themselves. So the body of Christ has remained immature. We've remained as babes, but that's all changing. Jesus came and eliminated the duality. That's what, that's what the book of John's all about. That's the heavy revy of John, no duality. Jesus came and brought the two into one. He merged divinity and humanity as the prototype. He is the prototype merging, the entrance into 
all mankind being one with the Father, being 100% divine, 100% human. Now, if that rocks you, I'm sorry. If that sounds like heresy to you, I'm sorry. That's, that's just the fact. Jesus took us and embraced us. Listen, listen. He embraced us and absorbed us into himself in every step of the redemptive process. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He was in Christ bringing us to Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 says that if one died for all, then all have died. You've already died your death. It's appointed a man once to die. You've died your death. You were crucified with Christ. Isn't that what Paul says? You say, man, that sounds mystical. Yes, it is mystical. When this flesh body wears out, and there's going to be a generation, this flesh body does not wear out. All your cells are continually regenerating. And at some point, we're going to catch up to the revelation that Death has been defeated. And you don't have to depart until you're ready to say, I depart. No man can take your life. You lay it down. You say, it's time. I finished the course. I've done what I need to do. I'm ready to step into the next level of higher consciousness, which is what, what happens when, when you leave this body. You don't stop living. Your consciousness does not change. See, if, if you're fearing death, you've not been made perfect in love. You just need to be filled up with more love and understanding of who the Father is. But here's the point. Here's the point. Jesus absorbed us into himself. If one died for all, then all died. And it goes on in Romans chapter 6. Since I'm over there in Romans, let me just read verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, and we have, then certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So you have resurrection life in you. We, we were crucified with him. We were resurrected with him. This, it's just part of the process. Paul's saying in verse 6, you can't start one part without the other part coming true. If we, were, if we died in the likeness of his death, and certainly we're going to resurrect in the likeness of his resurrection. You need to give some thought to what the likeness of his resurrection is. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. The old man died. It, that stuff is all history. It's in your rearview mirror that sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Actually, the word freed there in the center reference of my, of my Bible, and I looked it up, it's, it's accurate. It means you have been cleared from sin. There's no, there's, no, there's no sin on your account. There's no sin left within you. He that has died, which you did, we just read it. You just read it. If one man died for all, then all died. Therefore, this whole sin idea is, is a very moot point that the body of Christ keeps ra raising. You were born from death to life at the resurrection, right? The only, the only death that you experience is, is from sin. And it's not from God. It's the, it's the price tag that sin carries with it. Wages of sin, not the wages from the Father. The wages of sin is death. death carry, sin carries its own kickback. It has nothing to do with God. But God said, look, we're going to take that. We're going to, we're going to move, move this off entirely. And John nail, nails it down so well in that ninth verse and that 14th verse. When the ninth verse says that he is the light that lights every man that comes into the world. And that 14th verse says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt in us, in all of us. Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22 and verse 23. He says, that As all die in Adam, even so shall all be made alive in Christ. And then he says in verse 23 that that will happen each man in his order. There is an order to this. The Father is working a, a gigantic plan. The Father is working a plan that he established from the beginning. The Father, the Father knew from the beginning what the end would be. He knows the end from the beginning. And then he plans. Once he knows the end from the beginning, then he plans back from the end to the beginning. So right now, wherever we're at on this trail, there are still friends, family, and loved ones that may be their order has not come yet. Their number hasn't come up. And it's because God is working this total plan. And I'm going to get into that this year. The total plan of God is the restoration of all things. Acts chapter 3, verse 21. 
Jesus is held in the heavens. The, 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 the full revelation of all this is, is not fulfilled yet until the restoration of all things spoken by the prophets since time began. Uh, that's in, in Acts chapter 3. So all of this plan God is working out. So he, he says, all die in Adam, all made alive in Christ. Verse 23, 1 Corinthians 15, every man in his order. Humanity has been born from death to life objectively, all of us. Subjectively, we're working it out in our order. Objectively, it's a done deal before it ever becomes subjective. In, in, 19, uh, in 1965, I was objectively, but not subjective, walking in what I'm explaining to you this morning. I wasn't awakened to it. Those white-haired PhDs that I had back in school never, never explained. Do you know why they never taught it? Because they didn't know it themselves. It had not been revealed to them. They weren't manifesting it. I mean, I, I probably need to give you a couple verses on this. Look at, look at second, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. This, this, this is one of those verses, again, you never hear in church. And this is, I want to show you objectively exactly what I'm talking about talking about. 1 Timothy chapter 1. I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9. It says that he has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Not according to our works, not according to your magic prayer, not according to your disciplined life, not according to your rule keeping, not according to your religiosity but according to his own purpose and grace, watch, which was given to us in Christ before time began. Why didn't the pastor ever teach on that verse? Because it blows his theology, that's why. It blows, it blows him giving you an altar call at the end where you would come bawling, squalling, asking God to forgive your sin, uh, to come save you. See, that's all duality. Now we're eliminating duality. It's one, oneness, one. Watch, he gave it, it's not according to your works, but according to his purpose, which he's working out, and grace, which was given to us in Christ before time began. Read it out of your own Bible. Read any version you want. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. See, that's, that's the objective reality. And then you know that verse, Ephesians 1, 4. I quote it so much that you probably all know it by heart. He chose us in Christ before time began. Now you understand 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23. It all transpires in order. Each comes in his order. That's the awakening plan of the Father toward the end product of the restoration of all things. Now, as we come through the book of John, the awakening, John ties to three words, knowing, receiving, and believing. It's, it's awakening to our identity as divinity that was always present, but we didn't know it. And because we didn't know it, catch this, because we didn't know it, we could not believe it, nor could we receive it. So you cannot believe and receive what you have not had revelation of. The revelation comes first. You begin to see it in your spirit, and your head says, I don't believe that, I'm, I'm, I, can't, I can't go with that. But your, 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 your knower begins to really go, go, it begins to embrace it. So once you know it, then you can believe it and receive it, all right? So the, the kingdom we have, is within us. That's absolutely true. You are one with Jesus, being as he is in this present world. Whatever you look at Jesus, whatever you see in Jesus, I know this is too big for many of you. Whatever you see in Jesus is a absolute picture of yourself. You're a new creation, my friend. You are not just a mere human anymore. You're not just a human. You are a God-man who is now walking this planet, manifesting as a son of God in full union with the first son who has brought to us everything and absorbed us into himself and given us all that he is. See, being born again is not about the magic prayer. It's not about Jesus being your best friend forever. Your birth was not, we read it in verse 13, John chapter 1, your birth was not of flesh and blood. 
It was not of man. It says it was fully, totally, entirely of God. He, he is the author and the finisher of your birthing. First birth, second birth. It's totally him. It's not you. Now, I know that's hard on our old evangelical mind to get around of because of all the years that we were initiated into thinking we had to somehow be the ones that went to him to try to initiate fellowship, relationship. John, John, John 1 tells us just the opposite. It was a God thing. It was a God thing void of any human, any human production, any human input. He did it. Because, see, God knew that if he leaves anything up to us, we're going to blow it. So God says, I'm going to take care of that. I'm going to send Jesus as a representative of all humanity. And what happens to this one happens to all. So this one, Jesus, became God in flesh form, fully manifesting the fullness of the Godhead. It says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, he embraced the fullness of the Godhead. And John 1 then tells us that we were, were birthed again through the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus. We became a new creation in Christ. Old things passed away. I mean, Peter caught it. Let me, let me read 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Then I want to I pick up one, one thought that uh, Francois does so well in the, in the mere translation of the Bible. Watch this, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. It says, we were born again, not of corruptible seed. That means not through natural means, but of incorruptible through the word of God. The word of God is an incorruptible seed. It's a hybrid seed. Whatever it's planted to do, it will produce. And that word was planted in you and it will produce everything that it was sent to produce. It might take a thousand years. It might take a thousand years to produce it. I'll tell you what, it will produce it through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. When that seed comes into you, it lives there and it abides there. It produces forever. It will continue to produce through the eons of time. Now there's one phrase that Francois picked up in the Mirror Bible that I want to read from 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. He says it like this, the indestructible living seed of the Word of God conceives, watch, conceives conceives resurrection life within you. This life, this resurrection life, this seed is, man, this is so mind-blowing. It is equal to its source. So whatever the source is, that seed that has been planted within us is exactly the same thing. I am dropping so much on you this morning. My, my, I'm, I'm getting dizzy. I'm getting drunk just delivering the word this morning. Notice, equal to its source. I don't think most of us are ready to hear that. I, I have a lot of opposition when I begin to talk about who we really are, who this Christ is within us. I get pushback from grace people, from finished work people, because we're not willing to allow the light to get a little bit brighter to shine and show us the next step of the journey. See, we've way underestimated who we are. We've way underestimated the new creation. The gospel, the good news, is not so much about Jesus, who Jesus is. It's more about who you are and who you've always been. Not physically, not physically born of flesh and blood. The gospel is about who we are spiritually as children of God and, and, the, and the dynamics of all that that means. See, we often say it's not about what we do. Has nothing to do with what you do. It's all about who you be. Who you be was established, look me in the eye, who you be was established by the Father before time. We just read it, 2 Timothy 1.9, Ephesians 1.4. I could give you a fistful of scriptures. It had nothing to do with you. It's been a work of the Father that he, that he culminated in Jesus and then put all of us into Christ before time began objectively. Subjectively, Jesus came in time, walked out the plan of the Father, and died our death so that we don't have to die. Death has no more dominion over us. You'll never die a death. Paul calls it Christ in you, the hope of glory. Another word for glory is the manifestation of God. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So you move from glory to glory, from revelation to revelation, from manifestation to manifestation. So the more we understand this Christ in us, the more we can go from glory to glory or from greater, 
Christ is us life to greater Christ is us life. Now, I got a message this week. A person said, who is this Christ really that is within us? Who, who is this Christ? Well, first of all, we, we read back in uh, John 1 that it, he was the creative agent, the Word of God that became flesh as Christ, Jesus Christ, Don Christ, Billy Bob Christ, Mary Christ. It, it, it is the very creative power of God that resides within us. But it's, it, it, and it's encased, Paul got it. Paul got the revelation. And it's encased in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. See, everything that I teach you, um, I, I, I try to bring scripture to it. I call it making it legal. My old friend Darren Begley called it making it legal. That's a good way to place it. Make it legal. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 24, it says, But to those who are called both Jews and Gentiles, those that are called Jews, that's everybody, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So this Christ that dwells in you, who is it? It's the power of God. And it's the wisdom of God. So what, what you, when, I, when we talk about the Christ in us, man, we're talking about the power of God and the wisdom of God that dwells within you. Paul said, if the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, it's going to quicken your mortal bodies. See, where, where, your, where your real life comes from, where this physical life comes from, is not through veggies and vitamins. That, all, that all's good. But what really keeps this physical body alive is the spirit that is within us. When the spirit says that's enough, when the spirit says job done, completed, it's finished, then like Jesus, we can give our life up. Nobody took Jesus' life. He gave it up voluntarily. Nobody can take your life until the spirit is so done that it evacuates the physical body. Like I said, there's coming a time this physical body is going to be so regenerated by the spirit that is within that death itself is going to be placed under our feet. That's what he's talking about here. But the point I want to make is the Christ that is within you is 1 Corinthians 1.24. Read it for yourself. It's the power of God and it's the wisdom of God. The Mere Bible translation says that we are defined in Christ. So whatever, whatever you see the Christ as, that's what defines you. In other words, you as human have an identity. Do you know what your identity is as a human being? Can, can I just tell you very simply? Can I just tell you very easily that the identity that you have as a human being is Christ? It's Christ in you. The word that became flesh indwells your flesh a hundred percent. We didn't get to the verse this morning. And I may not get to it, but in John 1, 16, I, listen, I, I just got done saying the word that became flesh, the word, the Christ that became flesh dwells in you 100%. I didn't get to verse 16 of John 1, but it says, of his fullness, we have all received. Of his fullness, we have, again, here's that word, all received. You say, man, I don't feel like it. Well, that's because you haven't wakened to that place yet that you're willing to allow it to continue to expand. Scripture says, not only is Christ the, the, the power and the wisdom of God, it says that Jesus came full of grace and truth. So here's what, here's what the fullness of the Godhead that dwells in you consists of. It consists of the power of God, the wisdom of God, grace, and truth. So not only are you defined in your true self, which is spirit man, as wisdom and power of God, you're also defined as wisdom and truth. There's only one Christ. There's only one Christ. And we are all, come on, I, I don't know any other way to break it down. We are all, there's only one Christ. It's not you and Christ, it's just one. We are all in full union with the Christ. He includes everybody. He includes everybody. And why I wanted to go through John this year is because he eliminates this total concept of duality. Duality has got to go. It's not Jesus in you, Christ in you, the Father in you. That's not the way it breaks down. Paul said, Christ in you Gentiles, this long-held mystery, this, this long-held uh, truth that generations did not see is now being made plain. If Paul saw it 2,000 years ago, 
If Paul broke the revelation 2,000 years ago, then don't you think, just maybe, <laughs> 2,000 years later, we ought to be able to get a crystal clear picture that is even a little bit more clear than the one that Paul carried. The point is this, the point of the teaching this morning, the point in what John is carrying us is that there is just one. It's you and Christ together as one, just as it was Jesus and Christ together as one. You no longer live your own life. You no longer belong to yourself. You're not your own. The, the scripture says you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. It's too late. You can't stop the purchase. You've already been redeemed. You've been fully reclaimed. You've been fully bought. You, you belong to him. And by belonging to him, he has taken and imparted to you. He's imparted to you grace and love and truth, everything that is of his fullness he's taken and he has placed it within your life. And now is the generation that we're beginning to explore that. Now you can take that as far as you want and you can take it, take it as deep as you want. And just let me say this, let other people catch up with where you're at because I'll assure you there's other people further down the road than you are. We all need to give one another love and grace and demonstrate what we have within us to the utmost that we can. But we need to understand that we're all included in this and we're different places in the journey. So never act condescending or act like, I don't understand why you don't get it. I, under, I see things I'm not even teaching yet because I want us all to catch up and be on board. There is no duality. The point of the teaching this morning is this. There is no duality. Here's what I want you to see. Here's, here's kingdom new math. One plus one plus one plus one equals one. If you remember nothing else from the teaching this morning, remember this. The Father plus the Son plus the Holy Spirit plus you equals one. There's no division. There's only oneness. He enlightens every person. This one, Scripture says, enlightens all of us. One, one is non-dualistic. It's not you and him. It's not him and you. That's what it means to be born of God and to be children of God. It means that there's a union, that there's a oneness. One God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in all. You died with Christ and you resurrected with a brand new identity. The earth has never seen people like you. Earth has never beheld God-man before. Jesus came and started it, and now you have tacked on to it. He transformed you into your true, authentic self, which is divinity. Child of God himself. All right, I think that's where we want to stop this morning. Next Sunday morning, I'm going to do one more installment in John, which will give us three in a row. And then we'll talk about a couple other things that will keep coming back to the book of John all year long. Hope you picked up something this morning. I laid out so much for you. I know it's a little bit overwhelming. Take the time. You're really investing. When you listen to me at the Digital Cathedral, and I'm not tooting my horn, uh, but here's what's happening. You're making an investment in yourself. You're making an investment in yourself. I, I have a, a vision, that is to bring you to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And I want to get you there just as fast as I can get there myself. I, I, I'm not going to teach what I'm not, I can't demonstrate or manifest. I, I've seen this truth. I'm living this truth. I want you to embrace it and live it as well. Next Sunday morning, I want to look at John the Baptist. Very interesting character. So after next Sunday morning, that'll be three installments in a row of, of the Gospel of John. We'll move on to uh, another thing. A couple of things for a couple of weeks. We'll come back and we'll keep weaving our way through John. But there's so much I want to learn this year. And I want to begin to introduce to you the restoration of all things, which is the purpose of the manifestation of the sons of God. It's not just to live for yourself. It's to restore all of creation, plants, animals, everything. Restoration of all things to the Father himself. Got some great truth to unfold as we go through this year. Thank you for your help. Thank you for your financial support. You can give on the donkeithley.com website, uh, PayPal link there. Thank you for prayer. Thank you for being part of the Digital Cathedral, your family. And as we make this journey together, it's going to get better and better and better and better. I I'll guarantee you that. We're just on the outskirts of all that God has for us. See you Wednesday night at the Secret Place and next Sunday morning, 10 a.m. Central, once again, 
at the Digital Cathedral. God bless. Have a good week. Have a Jesus-filled week. See you next time.